Want to start off? Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. Um, really, the work of Global Health doesn't come to me lightly. It comes to me um, as a lifeline for me. Um, I grew up in rural western Uganda. Uh, we are cattle keepers. I consider ourselves the cowboys of, of, of Uganda. So raise cows by the age of four. I had sat on a chair. I, I learned how to milk a cow by the age of four. That same year, I lost three of my sisters uh, to, uh, to measles, uh, something that is preventable. By the age of six, I had lost my mother to cancer, uh, of course, because of lack of access to healthcare. And by the age of 10, I had lost my dad to AIDS. And so um, remembering my grandmother moving in to take care of me, at that tender age of 10, I knew that I had to do something. Um, and uh, luck, of course, uh, was there, or there were people that are available. I made a, a long journey from my village of, I would say, about 500 miles to go to the city to tell the president of my country, saying that I need to go to school because my parents were dead and I needed someone to send me to school. Long story short, when I tell these people, they always want to, uh, uh, know the details, but it took me three months, and then um, the, the third month, I was able to land in, in front of the first lady of the, of the country, and she sent me to high school. Fast forward six years later, I graduated out of high school, and I was given a scholarship to, uh, among the first lady selected uh, uh, scholars who had done well, but had lost their families, uh, either in war or disease, to go to the United States to get their college education. I was excited. You know, a kid grew up in rural Uganda. You know, when I was going to go the first, the president, I bought my first shoe. I sold my cow, uh, my goat, and I bought shoes to go to go see the president. Here I was excited. I'm going to go see America and study. And 9-11 happened. And my scholarship, for some reason, happened in international relations. Whatever happened, scholarship didn't show up. But I always knew that I wanted to continue doing the work that, that, that really you know, that took away my family. I knew that there were families suffering with HIV and AIDS that didn't have access, and I knew that I, that's where I needed to focus. And then um, just, just when I was just about to give up, I met a group of uh, uh, missionaries who came to Uganda to do work uh, from the US. To do, they bring youth and um, uh, to work in providing solar light in clinics, schools, and orphanages in the rural communities in my, in my community. And they wanted someone who understood the language but who spoke a little bit of English, and I was excited to join and volunteered. And by third year, um, the, the couple that came from Tallahassee, Florida, most people may not know that Tallahassee, Florida is the capital of Florida, um, they saw my passion climbing up, uh, you know, putting up you know, th that solar light that would, you know, a mother would be able to give birth in light. Most times, mothers were giving birth under kerosene lamp. That's the same fumes that were coming out of the kerosene lamp were infecting the child that would end up getting asthma and all kinds of diseases. And so I was excited because I saw the line. Long story short, the couple said, we will take you, James, after I shared my story with them. And they said, we'll bring you to, to, to Tallahassee, Florida, and you will get whatever education you want. I went undergrad, studied uh, biomedical mathematics with hopes to go to medical school. But eventually, I, when I started my first public health course, public policy, I knew that I had to go into policy making. And right after when I finished, I was look, my master's of public health, I was looking for organizations that were working with young people, trying to bring this health access. And I remember I was reading books by Paul Fama. I had read everything that I could, and I was excited. And then I signed up on the web page of the Partners in Health web, website. And I remember finding the line saying, if you want to be a global health fellow, apply to Global Health Corps. And I cannot tell you, like, after reading through, saying the movement for young leaders who are going to change the landscape of health, of healthcare in the developing world in here, I couldn't. With all the excitement, I applied. And luckily enough, I was given the opportunity. And my life has never been the same. And you'll hear more to, to follow. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my story begins by freshman year of college. I had this notion that I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up. And to test this hypothesis, signed up for an internship in the housing unit at Greater Boston Legal Services. And you know, basically showed up the first day uh, you know, ready to make photocopies and coffee and all the things you're qualified to do as a freshman in college. Um, but ended up really getting kind of thrust onto the front line um, pretty much for the very first day. And over the course of about nine months, had dozens of conversations with low-income families in Boston who would come in uh, presenting with housing issues because we were a housing unit. Um, but whenever you scratch the surface, there was always an underlying health issue. So one of my very first clients came in. He was about to be evicted because he hadn't paid his rent. But of course, he hadn't paid his rent because he had been paying for his HIV medication and just couldn't afford to pay for both. 
Um, you know, or we would have moms who would come in where the kid has asthma but wakes up covered in cockroaches every morning. And you know, just over the course of those nine months, grew kind of fixated on this connection between health and poverty, and also really frustrated with feeling like we were intervening so far downstream in the lives of these families. Like they inevitably came to us literally with their belongings on the street, and it just it felt like you know, there just had to be a better way. So at the start of my sophomore year, I read about the work that Barry Zuckerman was doing as chair of pediatrics of what was then Boston City Hospital, the big public hospital in Boston. And Barry's actually first hire as chair of, of peds was a, a legal services attorney to represent the patients, which I obviously thought was brilliant. And with his blessing, spent about six months kind of wandering the halls of this huge public hospital, basically asking the doctors, if you had unlimited resources, what's the one thing you would give your patients? And kept hearing the same story again and again, which we've heard literally hundreds, probably at this point now thousands of times since then, where the docs would just say, you know, every day we have kids that come into the clinic, kid has an ear infection, I'm prescribing antibiotics, but the real issue is that there's no food at home. The real issue is that this family is living with three other families in a one bedroom apartment, and uh, you know, with asbestos and lead paint, and the heat just got turned off. Oh, and they're running out of food at the end of the month. And, um, and we don't ask about those issues because there's nothing we can do. And they would just say, you know, I have 13 minutes with each patient. Patients are piling up in the clinic waiting room. Uh, I have no idea where the nearest food pantry is. I wasn't trained to do this in med school. And you know, we just don't have any capacity to be able to address these needs. And you know, even today, that clinic, like so many of the clinics where Health Leads works, has two social workers for 24,000 pediatric outpatients. So the whole notion was to say, you know, how can it possibly be the case that we know exactly what patients need to be healthy, and yet just simply haven't designed a healthcare system around that reality? And Health Leads model, uh, which was born of those conversations, was. Um, you know, really around this notion of how do we enable physicians and other healthcare providers to, as Barbara was saying, to prescribe basic resources for those patients. So access to safe housing, healthy food, get their electricity turned back on, the same way they would prescribe medication. Patients can then take those prescriptions to health leads desk in the clinic waiting room, the same way they take a regular prescription to the pharmacy. And we now have a core of about 1,000 uh, competitively recruited, well-trained college student advocates mm -hmm. who work side by side with the families, following up with them every week to connect them out to those resources that they need to be healthy. And you know, I think you know, to this sort of notion of what inspired you to do the work and what continues to inspire, to do, inspire us to do the work, I think what's so, um, in healthcare there's so many pieces that are, um, in some ways out of our control. So like when you think about, you know, the cure for cancer. So, you know, there's many talented folks that are diligently working on this question. Mm -hmm. And there's also a little bit of like, hopefully we'll just figure it out. Like we'll stumble across it through good ideas and good research. Um, but there's like a strong sense that there's luck involved. And what drives me crazy is this notion that we actually know exactly what patients need to be healthy. I've never had a conversation with a hospital executive who's been like, well, I'm just not sure about this whole like healthy food thing. Like, is it really critical? <laughs> and yet we don't make choices that are aligned with that understanding. And you know, part of what deeply motivates me in the work of Health Leads is really this question of you know, why don't we do what we know we need to do in healthcare? And how do we begin really causing that system to be much more honest about what patients need to be healthy? And how do we really think about redesigning that system towards that outcome? Those are really hard to follow, wow. Um, so my experience was uh, as a patient, um, also a sophomore in college, <laughs> um, small world, um, had seven surgeries over the course of about 20 months uh, playing sports in college. And it sounds very cliche, but when you go from uh, eating 10,000 calories a day, working out four times a day, to not being able to walk for six months, um, you see the world very differently. And um, I sat there as a patient and had all this research basically trying to understand how the hell I got here. Uh, after the sixth surgery, the doctor said, hey, you can't play sports again. And 
my whole point was every surgery I had was to play sports again. That was what defined me as a person, and that's what I thought uh, I was going through. And when you sit there and you realize that there's all this data, very similar to the way you ended your um, intro, there's all this data about what to do differently, but we don't do it. So as a patient, I went from zero to seven, which now became nine surgeries, basically in the blink of an eye, and no one ever stopped to say, hey, what if you didn't have the surgery and you did rehab? Mm -hmm. What if you changed your diet and tried to do this? And I only realized that after I had seven surgeries. And so I dropped out of college and wanted to start a company that was all focused on organizing data and the experience around the patient to be very personal and to be very actionable. The problem with healthcare as it is today is it's not personal or actionable. So I would get content back that said, hey Grant, you probably are 60 years old and have arthritis, maybe you need knee replacement. In 21, I don't need a knee replacement and I'm not 65. Um, and so you wanna get to a place where data can find you as the individual and it can be personal. Say, hey, here's another person like you that plays sports and here's a surgery they went, and he went through and here's what their outcomes looked like. And the second piece was, um, sort of like the cancer comment, uh, health isn't actionable right now. So if someone says, hey, you got to brush your teeth every day, okay, what if I don't do it for a month? What if I don't do it for six months? What if I don't do it for a year? You actually don't see any problems. I mean, you might have some issues, but you know, gum disease, heart disease, uh, cancer of the mouth, those things don't come in a month, a day, six months. They take a very long time to develop. So there's no feedback loop in healthcare that says, hey, by doing this, you're going toward this goal. And so I really wanted to create that infrastructure where you could make health very small and very actionable because people want to change. Nobody wants to be a patient, they want to be a person. And so uh, four years later, uh, I get to sit on the panel with these guys. So. Awesome, thank you. Um, on that note, I'm curious both Grant and Rebecca, if you can talk to us about numbers. I mean, how many people have you worked with? How many people do you want to work with? And um, I've talked a lot with Rebecca about sort of their plan to work themselves out of a job. What do you want to where do you hope you are in five years based on how the healthcare landscape might change? So for us, um, you know, we're, we're very focused right now uh, on the US, but starting to see, uh, as everyone can imagine, health is an unbelievably macro global economic issue, mm -hmm. um, especially with we see a lot of opportunity in Latin America um, because they're sort of trailing how the US has grown in terms of socioeconomic status, uh, access to technology. And so for us, you know, our goal is you know, take, o take over all 315 million people and give them a truly consumer-focused experience. Um, we talked earlier about exchanges. Exchanges have created a huge wave, whether you agree with the law or not, in how people think about their health, but they still have to find a way to navigate it. So now they can think about it differently, they can have access to it, but how do you navigate it? So if I buy a silver plan, what does it actually mean? Can I see this doctor or that doctor? And those same principles apply everywhere else in the world uh, at different scales with different types of infrastructure. So for us, um, you know, we're rolling our product out and hope to be, you know, at 100 million users in the U.S. over the next few years and then take that um, around the world. And, you know, I think for us health is probably the single most important thing that anyone sees. I mean, economics, um, happiness, family status, those all derive from health. And so I think that that's why it's an unbelievably global issue. And whether it's 6 billion or however fast the population grows, I think everyone will need, have a need to access health through technology and be consumer focused. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hopefully I don't manage myself out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this year, Health Leads Core of about 1,000 college student advocates will work with 15,000 patients um, in 22 clinical sites in seven cities. But to, to Barbara's point about working ourselves out of the job, you know, from the very beginning, Health Leads' goal was um, use the word actionable to really prove that addressing the realities of patients' lives was achievable. And you know, especially when you're dealing with vulnerable patient populations, the healthcare system just has this sort of sense of, um, and, and legitimately so, like, you know, poverty is just it's so big, it's so messy, it's so intractable, intractable, it has like, you know, it's so multi-tentacled. Like, how could how could either I, as an individual healthcare provider, or you know, as the leader of a clinical site or a healthcare institution, like ever begin to really meaningfully make an impact on it? And so much of Health Leads' work has been around proving that, in fact, it is possible to have honest conversations with patients about what they know they need to be healthy. So, for example, you know, we 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 constantly see patients who come into the clinic, and you know, they're diabetics. They're supposed to be managing their diabetes. They've been prescribed insulin, and yet their electricity was turned off six weeks ago, and they can't refrigerate their medication. And the clinical care just becomes kind of like the tree falling in the forest. There's no reality for these patients' lives. So, 
our endeavor is to actually demonstrate that it is possible to ask these questions of the patients and also possible to act on the answers to those questions. So just to give, you know, if your kind of unit of action is the patient, you know, what we really think about is the clinical site. So just to kind of, you know, make this tangible, um, Healthies launched this past fall in two adult internal medicine clinics in a large academic, prominent academic medical center in Boston. And you know, these are clinics that have about 50,000 patients um, and about 10,000 Medicaid patients. So even though, um, you know, they have a significant low-income patient population, but you know, my board chair, who's a venture capital guy, gets his care at this clinic. And when we started working with the clinic, you know, we said, okay, our expectation is that you will systematically ask your patients five really simple questions about the realities of their lives. You know, are you worried about paying your bills? Are you worried about feeding your family? Are you employed? Do you want to be employed? Very simple questions. And they were like, oh, that sounds really complicated. You know, we're doing this EMR implementation and this primary care transformation. And like, you know, the clinic administrator basically said, you know, there's no way in hell we're doing this. <laughs> and, um, and you know, we really kind of insisted on um, this notion that if you're gonna if you're gonna actually try to, to manage the health of your patient population, you have, to, you have to ask these questions. And what was so profound was that even though only 20% of the patients in the clinic were actually receiving public health insurance, when we started doing the screening, 59% of the patients had at least one significant unmet resource need. And this is stuff like food, housing, employment, I mean, very, very basic resources. And, what was fascinating was just how profoundly that has begun to influence the ability of the leadership of that clinic to really um, do right by their patient population, to meet their needs, to make strategic decisions, to make the right clinical choices for that patient population. So when we think about kind of health leads working itself out of a job, our ultimate aspiration is to really be able to demonstrate to healthcare institutions that by asking these questions, you know, they're not only doing the right thing, but they're actually making strategic business decisions. We've started texting all of the patients we serve in that clinic a very simple patient satisfaction survey after those visits, and literally 100% of the patients we've surveyed have said they're more likely to recommend that healthcare institution um, to other patients because because of health leads, right? Because they're able to actually talk about the full set of things they need to be healthy. And you know, those are the kinds of metrics that I think are essential. So for us, this is all about a path to really demonstrating to the healthcare system that it can, um, that it can actually be designed and um, structured in ways that are accountable to the realities of patients' lives. Excellent, it's amazing. Um, so James, you grew up in Uganda, and mm -hmm. then you were working in the United States healthcare system when the Affordable Care Act was passed, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and now you're back in Uganda. I'm yeah. curious if you can first talk to us about sort of when you first started working in New York, your take mm -hmm. on the U.S. healthcare system and what you were doing, and now sort of how you're using that information in Uganda. Thank you. I've actually had a, um, quite an experience with the U.S. healthcare system because I told you I went to school in, at Florida State University, go Seminoles, because we won the championship. <laughs> If you don't know, uh, and I had time uh, in um, in Washington D.C. where I had my master's in, in sustainable development, so I had had experience with the U.S. health healthcare system. And when the Obamacare came out, I was one of the most like proponents for it because I really had worked in communities, for example, with hips, which is one mm -hmm. of our placements, uh, which is called helping individual prostitutes survive in really low-income communities in Washington D.C. where like uh, injection drug users and and uh, men having sex with men really lacked health health care because of the fact that they couldn't afford. And so I've always been a proponent of that because I come from the perspective of that healthcare should be a human right, honestly, for me, because we have a lot of people who pay taxes and like, we shouldn't have people just going without. And so uh, I, when I applied to Global Health Corps, I wanted the experience of understanding, really working in it, and how can I, the lessons that I learn, I'm always challenging myself to learn, use those, take them to Uganda, uh, and you'll hear Uganda is a different situation. So I worked in Harlem, um, and I worked with an organization called Single Stop, which is a partner yeah. with uh, Health Leads. Uh, we do a lot of work with them. And my major, go figure, 9-11 was the point when uh, my scholarship didn't show up. So I landed at Single Stop USA, and the first project I'm going to work on is to build uh, <laughs> a program to reach out to 9-11 survivors, <laughs> responders and survivors of 9-11 to get them enrolled in healthcare in the United States. <laughs> 
I was supposed to come to the US, 9-11 <laughs> affected me, I didn't come, and here, how, what a coincidence, I'm in, in, in the United States, in New York, and Michael Phil and I, the first project we worked on was to design a health uh, outreach program for the 9-11 responders <laughs> and survivors to the, uh, to the tragedy that didn't have access to healthcare. One, they didn't have lawyers. Two, they didn't have the wherewithal. Three, they spoke Spanish or another language, Hindi or whatever. So we went into communities in the Bronx, in, in Queens, in everywhere, and really created a program that people can log in and really get this access to healthcare. The other issue that I worked on was really uh, this idea that um, healthcare is not just uh, an isolated thing. It's, it's, it's really uh, holistic. We worked on financial inclusion, education for, uh, for immigrant communities and many others who are trying to, to get into the door to, to go to school. We all know that when you get educated and you have access to income, you are likely to make better choices for your health. And I don't know why there isn't a huge, I mean, everyday research showing correlation between education, income outcomes, and health. And so that's when I went back to Uganda. That's what I'm working on. I'm leading the alumni network in Uganda. And what we do is basically, one, challenge the government of Uganda to see the health gaps that are existing, for, for instance. We have a healthcare system, uh, but I'm going to tell you an example that will shock you. For every 20,000 people, we have one physician. For every 20,000, we have one physician, and likely six nurses. And so that's the challenge. So the pieces that I'm advocating for with my alumni network, thank, thanks to Global Health Corps, is to really ask our leaders. We, we, we did one huge event, it was called uh, uh, Exposing Healthcare um, uh, Disparities in Uganda. We invited the Ministry of Health, we invited the, the Uganda Youth Forum, other leaders to come and the members of parliament to come and see and we showed all these numbers. The minister uh, kept uh, uh, delegating someone, someone, until by the, the day of over um, almost 400 people showed up, but uh, the, we got the ambassador to Canada who showed up, which was great also. We said we would take that. But basically what we are trying to do <laughs> is to make sure that the government sees these gaps. And when they don't see it, we go ahead and do health outreaches that she knows that we've been doing and actually taking, collaborating with non-government organizations, uh, uh, private companies that have come on now to see our work and we go and do health um, uh, outreach programs. We just did one in northeastern Uganda where 744 people showed up. We just turned in a report to Global Health Corps, and we had only four physicians, and the rest were nurses. You have a, a long list, talk about, you're talking about healthcare here. You have a long list of people waiting in line from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. looking to get healthcare. So that's the kind of work that I'm working on. The, the, what I'm bringing from the U.S., is the idea that really we need to collaborate, we need to work together. What I learned at Single Stop was that they have community-based organization, including the amazing ones like Health Leads, where they work together in a loop in ensuring that veterans have healthcare, ensuring that elderly communities have healthcare. And that's what I'm trying to bring in Uganda by uh, connecting the private sector, the c c uh, civil society organizations, and the government to reach these communities. Amazing, will you tell everyone about when you tried to get your visa in the United States? <laughs> yeah, so that's an, so um, um, I, was, uh, I was at the consular office at uh, the, the, the U.S. Embassy in Uganda. It's a very intimidating place. Most of you haven't been there. For Ugandans, especially who come from other places, it's really amadin with a lot of guys looking at you with, with their black <laughs> uniforms, with guns pointing in, the, in that direction. So when you come in, you know, when you go in, you feel like, oh, wow, I'm already in. So I went to the consul and I presented my passport and she asked me, so what were you doing in New York uh, for the last year? And I said I was helping provide health care for poor New Yorkers in Harlem, and, and that's what I did for the last year. And she said, you have your visa. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so we, obviously, all of us are under 40. That's the reason for the panel. Um, and at Global Health Corps, we work with amazing young people every day. I know Health Leads does as well. And I think um, so much of this conference is around re-envisioning what health care will look like in the future. And that depends on the future workforce and who's working in health care. Um, every day we see that young people bring enormous assets to this field. And I'm curious if each of you, I mean, can talk about either your own experience being young and working in health or how you see young people sort of revolutionizing this space. Sure. So um, from my perspective, I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. It's about, it's about youth, not um, because they're young and they don't know what they're doing, but because they don't have to be burdened with all the things that haven't worked in the past. Mm -hmm especially for me and my role. Um, a lot of people that are 
you know, 20, 30 year insurance executives at, you know, some big insurance company say, well, we can't do that because mm -hmm. we tried that 25 years ago. Well, there was no iPhone 25 years ago. Yeah. And so for us, you know, as a company, about 80% of our employees don't come from healthcare, um, the vast majority of which are under 40. And part of it is they know what's worked at Zynga, they know what's worked at Facebook, they know what's worked at Twitter to reach a billion people. And so you can use those lessons learned and apply it to healthcare and not be burdened with all the things that don't work, why we can't make it work, why it costs too much. They can just say, hey, you can stand up a game and get a billion users. You can get Twitter to topple a government in Egypt. Why can't you use the same infrastructure to communicate that a medication is a month long, you need to take it every day for a month, not the first week when you stop feeling symptomatic. And so um, I think it's the energy and also the lack of, um, you're, you're not shackled by what hasn't worked and it's been, it's been great for us because health as an as a, um, industry is waiting for perfection in my opinion. So they're always waiting for, hey, we, we can't do this until the cl clinical trial's mm -hmm. done. We can't do this until the technology is perfect. We have to test it again. We have to check this, we've checked that. And every other industry is built off of iteration and trial and error and finding out what works, what doesn't work. And I think, especially now, you're seeing a change of that in healthcare because people are now trying so hard and moving so fast that they're leaving that old thinking in the past. And I think that's gonna be a huge for the country. Rebecca? Yeah, it was funny, I had this note, it's really hard for current actors to disrupt themselves. Um, Spot on. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's both, um, you know, um, as you were saying, you know, not being kind of shackled by experience, which is ironic. I mean, I think a lot of times the kind of, you know, supposed lack of experience that we have is, is sort of on its face perceived as a liability. And it's actually incredibly liberating. Um, it gives us an opportunity to really uh, reimagine quite radically how healthcare might be delivered and without um, having a vested interest in what has come before. I think the other piece of this is this notion, I think that, and actually I think we all are examples of this, is having one foot in the system mm -hmm. and one foot outside the system. Mm -hmm. And just how, I mean, that's, that's the future of healthcare, right? It can no longer continue to be siloed in the way that it has been and be financially sustainable, either at an institutional level or certainly at a systemic level. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just are so comfortable, I think, standing, um, straddling these things. I mean, HealthAid's whole work is saying, we actually have been able to demonstrate that you can make community resources an integral part of care delivery, literally. Like it's, it's part of the electronic medical record. It's part of the prescription pad. It's part of registration in the clinic. Um, and at the same time, we've been able to demonstrate that the clinic can be an exceptionally powerful gateway to connect patients back out to community resources that they previously either hadn't known about or hadn't known were relevant to their health and health outcomes. And so, you know, that, that opportunity to stand between the two, I think, is, is exceptionally powerful and something that we're really comfortable with. It's interesting because um, I'm sure many of you have read you know, Clay Clishenson's work, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, about this notion of either kind of catalytic innovation or disruptive innovation. And you know, the, whole, um, the whole notion of that is to say that, um, you know, that some of the most powerful disruptive models are sort of these quote unquote good enough models, right? They're actually not trying to seek perfection. They're ones that are actually seeking to get the job done. And you know, if that means being a little less perfect along the way, there's, we're comfortable with that because at the end of the day, we're gonna reach more people and have a greater impact. And um, uh, Professor Christensen sort of talks about these um, qualities that are endemic to catalytic innovation. And one of them is that they're more likely to actually be started by folks outside the field or the sector. Um, because they're less entrenched, and they tend to actually move more quickly through those sectors because they're not actually trying to seek the kind of approval or authority of existing actors. Um, and so I think, you know, again, these, I just think it's so ironic that so many of the things that are on their face perceived as liabilities mm -hmm. uh, and being new are exactly the things that are gonna drive transformation. Absolutely. Yeah, um, for me, really, uh, thanks uh, like for mentioning, you know, Twitter and technology. So the, the youth, uh, um, I think, have more propensity to leverage technology and social entrepreneurship. That's what I have to say. Uh, the governments of the West are working very well for you, for you people, and you know, thanks to the institutions that were built a long time ago, they are working. For us, we are working with governments that are actually taking us backwards. Um, you had the, the uh, anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda, including many other bills that have been passed. I was telling the earlier session that 
as we are gathered here discussing these issues, this is considered illegal in my country because there is a public order management law that says if young people especially gather together to discuss issues pertaining to their communities, uh, that they, 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 they are really, um, what's the English word they use? Treason. They are committing treason against the, 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 the government. And so um, despite all that, despite all that, we, haven't, we, we, we have not stopped working hard and innovating. And so for example, I'm gonna use examples from, the, from Uganda because that's where my work, but it goes across uh, the world. One is in technology. Now we have people who are using mobile technology really to access health. We have a, a young lady from Nigeria who is doing amazing work here with us in the Aspen New Voices for using technology, mobile phone, leapfrogged, leapfrogged healthcare to go and really people accessing prescriptions on their mobile phones, something that, you know, it's very hard in the West. So that reverse innovation that we can also bring to the West. On the other hand, for example, Twitter, um, there was a, a, an issue that happened in northern, the northern part of my country where, uh, and, and the idea too is that the youth are not so locked into these silos of um, I, I work in healthcare or I work in education. So one guy broke the story, he's a media guy who went to northern Uganda and the family, uh, 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 53 people had died of starvation in one of the uh, counties. Uganda is an incredible rich nation by all means, including gold, oil now, uh, agriculture, anywhere. It's, it's, it's injustice that our people should die. But this region has been marginalized for generations and we can talk more after that, uh, including a lot of uh, uh, policies that really were terrible. The first lady is the, the member of, of or the minister for that area and the member of parliament uh, there. And so the gentleman broke the stories below the age of 28, went, went, we, we, uh, a fellow Global Health Corps uh, 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 fellow who is a graduate working for a child fund as a manager for nutrition and, and food security picked it up and he said, not in our country now. He started a Twitter uh, handle called Feed in a Park. We must feed in a park. He tagged me in. I threw it to my com uh, community of educate. I work with youth at educate training, young leaders and entrepreneurs in Uganda. It went viral. We said, what can we do? They all came together by Twitter handle. We raised seven mil uh, 10 million Uganda shillings, which is close to 10,000 US dollars, which is a lot of money for young people. Companies came together. We bought food, put it on trucks, went to northern Uganda and delivered the, uh, the food to these communities that, that, that were starving. And uh, uh, funny, uh, funny enough, when we reached there, the, the, the member of parliament um, in the lower rank had already sent a letter to the national government. And when they went on the national television, they said, um, only eight people died. Why are you making so much noise about, about this? And so we, we worked with the member of parliament now where we are in the process. We are working on a bill that is gonna be supported by young people to come in, in parliament and say, we want nobody to die in our country because of lack of food. So we are working on, on a food security uh, nutrition law that has never existed in Uganda. So that's the zeal that I'm talking about of young leaders coming together to shape global health. Amazing. Um, so I have one more question for our panel and then I would love to open it up. And obviously all three panelists, um, all three of you have to be resilient and work really hard in everything that you're doing every single day. Because um, I know starting initiatives and working on huge challenges like health um, doesn't come easy. And so I'm wondering if each of you can tell us about one thing that you've worked on where you just felt like you were on fire and you were loving what you were doing and describe that for us. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> non, non health I have too many to think of. So go ahead. <laughs> Um, yes, we do have to be resilient. <laughs> I should also say for the record, I'm a mom of a three month old, so I have to be especially resilient. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the kind of most recent example of this is um, Health Leads has been extremely proud to um, literally as of a few weeks ago announce a partnership, a significant partnership with Kaiser Permanente. And you know, we had aspired for literally years to have a relationship with Kaiser, recognizing how powerful Kaiser is in the healthcare landscape in this country, and what it would mean if Kaiser, as an institution, um, chose to partner with Health Leads, and in doing so, to really elevate the importance of integrating patient social needs into care delivery. And you know, Health Leads is a extremely small organization, right? We have 80 staff, we have uh, a budget of about $10 million, and Kaiser is you know, the mothership. And um, we, you know, I think just nothing lit us up more than the opportunity to work with the really extraordinary leadership of such an influential health system to 
really enable them to articulate their own aspirations around addressing the realities of their patients' lives and to tackle side by side some of the most critical practical realities to bring that to fruition. And I think what's most kind of powerful about the relationship we have with Kaiser is that it's not just about you know, implementing Health Leads model, but really about saying, you know, how can we um, use the partnership between Kaiser and Health Leads to really capture some powerful data about what the impact is of addressing access to healthy food and safe housing, nutrition, uh, utilities in patient populations, and really begin to use this relationship to architect the economic case for, um, for this being an integral part of healthcare delivery. And at the same time, to also really partner in thinking about how can this model, this approach to care, be one that actually is a standard part of care, something that is endemic not only throughout Kaiser's really extraordinary network, but actually throughout the healthcare system. And you know, I think for us, the opportunity, again, to enable such a um, significant leader and visionary leader in the healthcare system to uh, experience achievability around this dimension of patient care was both wildly exciting and, and inspiring to us. I'll, I'll just say for me personally, I thought you were saying something fun. Um, I, I, as I told you earlier, my grandmother raised me. She's 92 years old. And I remember um, she told me something. She says, I want to die in dignity. And what that meant was that she wanted to die in a roof um, uh, that is not grass touched, that water is not pouring on her, and that has electricity. And so, ah, it's sad for me. I, Barbara means a lot to me. So after Global Health Corps, I returned home, and um, I was able to uh, build a home for my grandmother and put solar uh, light in there. And when I returned, she hugged me, and she said, now I'm ready to go home. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Um, so that, for me, um, the, I don't need more any other motivation. What I need is you, because when I come here, the fact that you could give me the stage, um, I tell a story that I, I make people laugh. As a kid, I, I grew up in rural Uganda where cows were the major thing. I told you I sat uh, to milk a cow when I was four years old. And so I would climb cactus trees, and I remember the planes would be passing in the air. And, and of course, I mean, I, I, before my parents died, I, I was happy. I mean, I didn't think about the rest of the world or whatever. But I always saw those birds flying. And I said, I wonder what it would take to sit in that you know, plane. And maybe one day I will. And so when I get the opportunity to fly here and sit on this panel, that's the inspiration that I need to go and fight the, 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 the battle that we need to fight. I maybe shouldn't call it the battle, but I should call it something else. It's a good <laughs> but, fight. <laughs> it's a good fight, but thank you. Thank you, James. I gotta stop going after you, that's too hard. <laughs> um, you know, I think for me, um, you know, we always say internally, engagement is our North Star. So the biggest problem in healthcare, we think, is people engage once and then they never come back, right? So, hey, you need to lose 50 pounds. And someone says, okay, great, they lose five, and then they give up and they put on 45 more and they're back to square one. So when we see and we sit by our product and look at it every day and we see someone, you know, percentage of the population that logs on and they come back and they come back and they come back and you can start to see how that trends and what those early indicators look like to someone's health status. That's every, all the other nonsense and how long it takes to get deals with health plans, all this stuff, it all goes away. Mm -hmm. so. Amazing. Thank you all. So with that, I'd love to open um, it up to the audience with questions. I see one right there. Thank you. Um, this goes out to James. Um, as a physician myself, I'm kind of concerned about the doctor-patient ratio you have. One to 20,000, you said? That's deplorable. Um, I mean, Nigeria, where I come from, has something of one to 4,000 there about, which is bad. But we have found a way to walk around that. I'm wondering what your organization or anybody on the ground is doing about um, probably raising capacity um, among nurses or other healthcare workers to serve as physician assistants as we have here in the US. Um, because I've seen that that seems to be a good model and I am currently working with my government to um, utilize the, the, the workforce of young doctors that come out you know, of, of medical school to get to the rural areas. And Because the problem is usually, even though the figures are one to 4,000, it's probably skewed to maybe one to 2,000 in the rural areas or urban areas and be one to 10,000 in the rural areas. And so there definitely are some work around and I'm wondering what your group or other people on the ground are doing about that. I mean, that's a great question. Um, huh, wow. So with 
with the, the alumni network, so we, um, we go to university, we have a university outreaches that, that we do and um, try to speak to um, the, the youth at the universities where we speak to them and talk to them about the importance of being involved in global health. However, we don't try to proselytize that they need to be you know, doctors or whatever, but we, we, we make it clear of the dire need of um, the need for healthcare workers and physicians in my country um, because that's a huge challenge. Um, I, 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 I mean, I have to go, I don't want to go into too much, is that there's a lot that could be done on the, on the side of us really figuring out who lobbies government to, I, I just written a piece in the, in, the, in, in the New York Times that I was doing, invest in education. So, and I don't want to blame the US, but we have the US coming in, giving us military technology to clamp on people like us who actually, you know, if I raise hell for government to, give, put more money, more investment in education to educate physicians and nurses to take care of our populace, the government has military power to silence me or take me away. And so this is something that really we have to understand. We need more support for such, especially from the international community. Uh, we get a lot of, of global fund. We get a lot of um, Gavi, the, the, the Global Alliance for Vaccination and all that. Uh, we would need a lot of support for us who do the grassroots work, really to uh, organizations like Action Aid and Chai to work on those issues with us, of course, with a network. We, we are working on it, but through the awareness perspective, because if we go bluntly to the government and criticize them, when you may not see me the next time I'm here. So, so those are the challenges that we are working on, and, and you too can know that the same challenges exist in, in, in Nigeria are almost the same as, as mine. So. I mean, one thing just to um, say on that note that makes me hopeful is that for the Global Health Corps positions that we had available in Uganda, we had 30, and we received 4,000 applications for those positions. So these are young people that are desperate to work on solving global health challenges. It's just not always clear how to get your foot in the door, um, which is just something to say that I feel like from the workforce perspective and from the desire of younger people to engage on these issues, it's there. It's a matter of then figuring out how to get talent into the field to be actually solving these problems. And, and then the, the other idea is really to raise awareness. I'm so grateful for, the, um, for the, the New Voices Fellowship that has given me the opportunity to write about this, you know, because at the end of the day, I may say it here, but it just ends here. But when you write it in the papers, for instance, like the New York Times or Al Jazeera, many people will get to know this is, this is an issue. You know, I remember, um, and I'm going to stop, um, uh, the uh, President uh, uh, Secretary John Kerry was coming to East Africa and was hoping on a plane, and, and I, was, I, I got his hand off from the Yali Network, and I was saying, invest in education, you're coming to Uganda, talk about, you're coming to East Africa, talk about education, when you talk to these big guys, but whether he gets it or not, uh, my job is done, is to do the noise as much as I can. So. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question for our esteemed panel? <laughs> no? Do you have questions for each other, panelists? <laughs> I just think there's an interesting question in terms of, to this point, around disrupting the system. And, you know, one of the questions is, um, you know, so I know your company was bought by a large health insurance company. And, you know, it's, there's always this tension between kind of being the disruptive outsider and then the disruptive insider. And how have you kind of thought about some of those trade-offs and choices? Um, it's, it, yeah, it's a really hard challenge. I mean, as you talked about, you can't, uh, most of the companies that have built and been in the system have built products that they don't, it's sort of like saying your kid is ugly. You don't want to say that that's my product that doesn't work. They, want, they keep trying to find ways to take something that's been 10 years old and just find a new way to make it work, even though it's not worked for 10 years. Um, and so the way we did our uh, deal actually was um, they wanted to embrace that outsider model. So we're actually completely outside, you know, this $120 billion company. And so we have our own company. We're completely run separately, financially everything, because we can actually break that glass mm. and have that rope to run and do things in a different mm -hmm. manner. And that was obviously very unusual, but it's, it's allowed us to see inside kind of the beast and figure out the things. There's a lot of things that do work. They need to double down on those and the ones that don't just move on, right, and be disruptive. And so that's, that's been, um, it's been great for us because it's been very unique to see that because as we've spent time, just like you with Kaiser and others, you know, these companies are just massive. I mean, healthcare in the United States is, you know, three, $400 billion industry, probably employs several million people per year um, in each vertical, so delivery, insurance, et cetera. And so you have these massive infrastructures. And there's a lot of things that actually work really well. 
Um, that's one of the things I think is interesting. You hear these talks, and I think health and physicians, especially in the United States, get bastardized a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, I've never met a doctor who gets into health for money, and yet everyone's blaming them. You know, take less money, take less money. Like that's not what motivates them. That's mm -hmm. not what gets them through residency and med school. And so you have to find those places where it does work and make sure you double down on it. Mm -hmm. And that's where that disruptive kind of inside out model does mm -hmm. apply. And you're spot on where you have to have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what, oh, yes. <laughs> Actually, I have a question for Grant, but first I think we ought to bring James's grandmother at 92 out to sit on the longevity panels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, just, I'm not familiar with your company grant, and um, I was just wondering if you could explain it in a way, what would a user go into your company online to do? What service do, would they get? Sure, so um, our product really is about taking different types of your health experience, so taking your insurance and saying, okay, now that you have this insurance, what are ways for you to optimize that cost and that quality? So if I know that you have a X plan with United, I'll make recommendations to say, if you see a primary care doctor, if you see this person, if you get a biometric screening, go onto our product, check in on your phone, and I'll lower your premium 100 bucks every time you do it. So we're trying to shorten that feedback loop to say, you've made a buy decision or your employer's made a buy decision, let's put health in your hands as you make these decisions and track them through so you can actually, things work out really well, you should be able to get health for free. So that's the gist. You should sign up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who is, is it, how many, customers for Grant's company that we have in here. It's all, it's all B2B right now, so okay. probably not many in the room. But we'll, we'll change that. Everyone how many customers up. will there be in here? Uh, so, oh, yeah. More hands, more hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that wasn't that many hands. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I want to thank our panelists. I think what strikes me about all three of them, actually, is that they're all disruptive insiders and outsiders in the work that they're doing. Um, and I am so grateful that we have three incredible, brilliant minds like y'all working on solving <laughs> our health issues in the United States and in Uganda and globally. So thank you all thank um, you. for your insights and thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.